All right, let's talk about the last main part of a typical empirical peer-reviewed journal article, which is the discussion section. And let's talk about how you would write it up in APA style. Plus, I'll talk a little bit about the abstract, which is a short summary that goes at the start of your paper, but is often written last once the main paper is already complete. So as far as where this stuff goes in the paper's organization, the discussion section wraps up the main body of the article, the, the meat, as it were, after which you've got all the extra stuff at the end, like the references and the appendices. And as I said, the, the abstract gets written late in the process, but it actually goes up near the top as a sort of preview of the whole article. Now, the purpose of a discussion section, in brief, is to interpret and evaluate your results within context. That means making sense of what your results section found, connecting it to other research on the topic, and also taking the bad with the good, as in acknowledging any problems or limitations to your research. As far as APA style goes, you can just continue it on the same page where your results section ended, so you don't need to start a new page or anything since this is still part of the main body of your paper. You'll give it a heading of the word discussion, centered and in bold. Then if you're not using subheadings, you would just start the text on the next line and indent the first word as usual. Now, whether it's broken down into subsections or not, the organization of a typical discussion section very often follows something like this order. I'll talk about each of these in more detail, by the way, but first, uh, the first thing you would do, you could just say, is give a summary or interpretation of your results in plain English. Like, no need for repeating the statistical numbers, but do make sure people understand what those numbers actually showed us. Then somewhere in there, you'll compare and relate your results to past research, putting it in context with other research. Then definitely you want to cover the limitations or confounds of your study, just in order to be kind of intellectually honest, because obviously no one study is perfect or answers a question completely. And finally, you'll include something about implications and or where future research on the topic should go. So I'll talk about each of these in turn. First, summarizing and interpreting your results in plain English. You just gave all the statistics and the numbers in the results section, but here's where you make it clear what those things really tell us. So maybe reiterate your hypothesis and then make it clear if it was supported or not. Explain the takeaways, like maybe you found an interaction effect and some well-known effect only applies to some people or in some cases. Try to write what your results show in a way that any intelligent lay person could understand. But of course, make sure you only make claims that are actually backed up by your data. So if you did a correlational study, be careful not to talk as if you've demonstrated causation. So an example might be, I tested the hypothesis that large amounts of caffeine would impair short-term memory. I found that the group assigned to receive a high dose of caffeine performed worse on the short-term memory test than the group assigned to receive a low dose of caffeine. So in plain words, what we found. I also found that the high dose group showed significantly lower scores than their baseline, while the low dose group showed no significant change from baseline. The data suggests that too much caffeine might lead to short-term memory problems. So you can see here that we're talking about comparisons between groups. I'm even using a term like significantly, which implies p-values, but I don't actually go back and give those numbers or p-values again necessarily. And remember, you're, you're usually answering some sort of question that was brought up in your introduction, so try to connect your results back to your original hypotheses earlier. Now the next thing you'll do, or at least somewhere in your discussion section, you want to compare or, re or relate your results to past research that others have done. So usually connecting it back to what you covered in your introduction section when you did a bit of literature review. So does it extend and support previous theory or theories? Maybe it overturns a previous theory or provides sort of a new interpretation of things? Uh, is it different than what is usually found in the research? Did you improve upon re previous methodologies in some way? If so, point that out here. Uh, did you study a new population, a new age group, something like that? Maybe all the past research was done on men and you did your study on women. Now is the time to explain and show how the results of women might be similar to or very different from men on this topic. Or did you raise new questions for some well-studied topic, like new angles on it? Point that out here. 
And as I said, the most important part of a discussion section is probably addressing the limitations of your research or confounds that are still part of it, like alternative explanations you couldn't rule out, things like that. So think about, I don't know, threats to internal validity, how they might apply to your study. Be honest, be critical. For the love of God, remember that no single study ever proves anything. So avoid that prove language and also avoid that kind of thinking. It is okay if your study only tackled part of the issue. It's okay if your study leaves some questions open. That is a normal part of science. So think, did your results only apply to a particular population? Did you maybe only test one group, like only women or only people in one part of the country or only those of a certain socioeconomic status? Or maybe you used a convenient sample rather than random sampling or, or something else that might have been more representative. Um, perhaps there was volunteer bias. Maybe your results only apply to the kinds of people that volunteer for this sort of study. Just consider quest questions like this about external validity and how well your study might generalize beyond your sample. For that matter, was your study only kind of short term? Is it possible that long term effects might differ? Or maybe it's the kind of thing like cancer that might only show up in the long term when you're studying humans, you know, instead of rats or something in a laboratory? Point that out. Uh, is it possible that the participants didn't follow your instructions or didn't follow them completely? Or maybe that one group didn't follow it completely? Is it possible the group you assigned to eat a certain diet didn't actually follow the diet, even if the other group followed their diet? Maybe the people you put in a no dogs group still happen to play with their friend's dog sometimes. Did participants maybe interpret your instructions differently than you intended? Or, or maybe the question wording you used, they didn't interpret correctly? Maybe they filled out the survey improperly? Those are things you might point out here. Likewise, is it possible that your behavior biased their answers? This is especially important for in-person studies. Did you maybe treat one group differently in certain ways? Or could participants, like overall, felt pressured to, to respond a certain way? Or maybe embarrassed to answer honestly if it's an embarrassing topic? Were they maybe influenced by your, your clothing? Was it like formal, informal? Or where the study was happening, like in a lab or out on the quad or somewhere downtown? Did the person measuring the outcome, so you, the researcher, did you know what condition people were assigned to? Or was it properly double blind? Now, that's not as much of an issue in a survey. You're less likely to bias people with your behavior if they're just taking a survey, especially online or something like that. But of course, if you wrote the questions in a certain way that telegraphed what you expected, then you might be biasing their results. They might be uh, you know, giving into those sort of demand characteristics just based on the way the questions are written. You might notice that after the fact and point that out in your limitation section. How about, are there any ethical issues in the way you did your design? Anything maybe that you did to address it or should have done to address it, or maybe realized in hindsight that you should have done? This in the discussion section would be a good time to bring that stuff up. How about operational definitions that you used for your variables? Did they really capture what you were interested in? Or did you just use the most convenient and simple way of measuring something that in reality is pretty complex and nuanced? Think about how you measured your variables, how you operationalized the constructs of interest, what surveys you used, or maybe you, I don't know, studied a new treatment for PTSD in unhoused people, but I don't know, maybe that's different than, than that treatment, uh, you know, for PTSD in military veterans. Like, did your study, you know, look at PTSD in general when maybe PTSD has subtypes or shows up in different ways for different people? Do we need more studies on this topic using maybe a variety of measures to try and capture the construct in multiple ways, or just a larger set of similar measures to check for consistency? Or think about confounds and alternative explanations, things that haven't been ruled out in your study. Are there any factors that you couldn't control for? It wouldn't be realistic, maybe. Is it possible people in one group dropped out and quit the study at a higher rate than the other group? That's a mortality threat, right? Is it possible that the way you treated your experimental group introduced some extra little differences compared to how the control group was treated? And maybe that confound actually explains their better results on the dependent variable? It is okay to have confounds. No study is perfect, but acknowledge them in your discussion section so future work can improve on it. And a big one, beware causation language if you did a correlational design. 
if your results are correlational, if you didn't do an experiment, then emphasize and remind readers that it does not prove causation. Now, you can still argue with, with other evidence, with logic, why you think A might cause B, but make sure you are clear that you know your correlational data does not prove causation. You just cannot conclude that A caused B simply because different levels or categories of A went along with higher or lower levels of B. You can argue for what you think might be going on, but stick to the evidence or phrase things in terms of possibilities. So you could say stuff like might cause or may impact or could decrease, that kind of guarded language. And overall, basically for, for limitations in your paper, just think through all the ways in which your study may be incomplete or still leave open some possibilities. You could go on the attack, play devil's advocate, pretend there is a cash prize for poking holes in your own study. This is much better than waiting and letting other people point out all the issues later. Finally, as I said, there's often a bit at the end of the discussion section after the limitations where you might talk about the bigger real world implications of your study and or about ideas for future research, and what might be studied or tested next on this topic. And this often comes out of the limitations section. So if nothing else, you can suggest a follow-up study that checks or rules out some of the possible confounds that you brought up in your limitations. So think about real world applications. Like in this example, I might say, the group assigned to do moderate intensity exercise showed significantly more improvement in depression scores than the group assigned to do low intensity exercise, which suggests higher intensity exercise could be an effective treatment for depression in college students. So that highlighted bit at the end there, that's the real world application and why this study is so important. We may not have proven it yet, but we're giving some evidence why this might be really important and thus leading the way to future research to confirm that. And as for what future research should address, again, this can include fixing or testing the limitations and confounds of your own study or follow up studies that get more in depth on the topic or other variables that might be related or interact with the phenomenon or whatever you think would be worth testing in the future because you are now a bit of an expert on the topic. So share your thoughts on what else should be studied about it. So if we look at a quick example of an APA style discussion section, you can see here in the first paragraph up top, they start by reiterating what they were testing and what they hypothesized. If you look at the next paragraph, it says in plain language what the results found. The hypothesis wasn't supported. Participants recalled the same number regardless of group, and there was no significant difference in scores. But then if we skip down to the third paragraph, you can see they're going over some additional results now about age and memory. They also tested stuff like that. So these, these first bits here are kind of like, what did we find? Summarize and interpret in kind of real world, uh, you know, everyday language. Then in the bottom paragraph here, you can see they're starting to connect it to previous research on the topic, the stuff they brought up in their introduction section. So they're talking about how the study contradicts previous literature. They've even got some new citations in here. Then a bit further down, they have a paragraph about a major limitation to their study, right? So in this case, the study happening during the COVID-19 pandemic led to a small sample size. They even continue on and have another paragraph on an additional limitation since they found their participants were getting frustrated and stressed and they explain how that might have affected the results, including with a citation to back that up. And then finally, they get into the concluding bit at the end there, which includes suggestions for future researchers to expand on this study and, you know, what someone might examine next. Likewise, here's a different discussion section, another one. And you can see in this case, they explicitly use some subsections with, with like subheadings here to organize it and tackle the major parts of a discussion section in the way that kind of made the most sense for them and their topic. So first, up top, they do reiterate their results, right? In plain language, they found evidence supporting the classical hypothesis over the MS to R hypothesis. And they explain that in simple wording without a bunch of numbers. Then there's a brief subsection on, they call it theoretical implications. So the, the theory and the spirited debate that they're talking about here, they're kind of connecting their, their work to the to the ongoing theoretical debate that's in the literature that they obviously talked about back in the introduction. 
Then at the bottom here, we've got a combined subsection at the end, getting into limitations and also future directions. So they actually start by talking about like methods that would be promising as a direction for future work. But then in the part below this, they get into limitations and how to address those in the future and so on. So I don't have that here, but limitations come after this. So I've got all the parts we've talked about. Now this one, this is not an example of an APA style paper, just FYI, but you'll notice that empirical articles, even in other fields and using other writing styles, still have the same basic components for a discussion section. Like this study, for example, was on television exposure as a toddler and later ADHD symptoms. So their discussion section starts with a summary and an interpretation of what was found. They say, we found that early exposure to television was associated with subsequent attentional problems. This was present even while controlling for a number of potential confounding factors, yada, yada, yada. The size of the association was such and such. And then toward the bottom of the paragraph, they actually relate it to past research, saying things like, to our knowledge, ours is the first study to test the hypothesis of very early television viewing on subsequent inattention using a nationally representative longitudinal sample. So this is what's new about their work compared to old work. But then they get into limitations and confounds, like the measure they used for attentional problems isn't the same as for clinical ADHD, for example. So that's kind of finishing the thought here. Uh, continuing here in the upper left, they argue why that might not be a huge deal, why they think it might not be a huge deal. Then in the upper right, they give some more limitations. They used parental report rather than directly measuring things. And then another paragraph, third, the big one, their study is correlational. So they can't draw causal inferences. They can't get causation from correlation. And go through all of that and talk more about that. And then finally at the bottom here, we get into some implications in future research. Saying things like, despite the limitations, our results have some important implications if replicated in future studies, yada, yada, yada. So you can see most discussion sections start to look pretty similar and have the same kind of content once you know what to look for. Now just some writing tips when you're writing your own. When you write a discussion section, don't just put in filler sentences and extra words to sound authoritative. It is better to keep things simple and clear. So science writing is not about length and it's not about using the most impressive words. It's about being very clear and precise. Make sure every sentence is there for a good reason or ditch it. Now do proofread what you write, meaning check for typos and misspellings, but especially make sure your grammar makes sense or people might totally misinterpret what you're trying to say. So if you read what you've written out loud and it sounds weird when you're trying to, to say it to someone else, you may need to have a friend who's a little more gifted at writing, read through it, give you some feedback, have some other people look over it for you. Okay, but at any rate, before we wrap this video up, I did want to mention one other part of a paper, which is usually written at the very end after all this stuff is done, and that is the abstract. So the abstract is basically a very short summary of your entire article, your whole paper. So you're going to go back through what you've written now that the whole paper is done and see if you can boil the essential down the essentials down into a single paragraph. This is what you might see if you're browsing papers online or you know, just kind of skimming to see what's worth downloading and reading fully. Sometimes, in fact, this is all that someone will ever see of all your hard work. So you have to spend some time, spend a little while crafting it, do it carefully to capture all the essentials, but without being overly wordy or without trying to cram all the unimportant little details into too short of a space for that. So in APA style, the abstract is generally 150 to 250 words. That is not a lot. That is one paragraph, basically. It goes on its own page. So after the title page, if you have a title page, it goes after the title page on its own page. And then you're going to have the abstract itself. So you'll put the word abstract in bold, center up, up top there, and then just start the actual paragraph of the abstract text on the next line. And in fact, in this one place, you don't indent it the way you would throughout the rest of your paper. So it actually look like a literal block of text below the word abstract. And remember, you're going to write it last because you need the paper done before you can summarize the whole thing well. Now, as you can see in this example here, the word abstract is up top. Then you have a summary, not indented, right? It just starts right in. But you have a summary that is basically going to be like the bits of a paper 
in short. So it'll start with introduction type stuff. It starts by introducing the topic, so basically a bit from the introduction section. Then it gets into the methodology, right? Kind of like the essentials of your method section. So here they explain the paradigm. They talk about the participants, how many they had, who they were, the lists of words that were used and what the participants did. So basically all the essential method section stuff. Then they say, uh, one way analysis of variance was used for one of the analyses, a Pearson correlation for another, and they summarize the findings. So that's basically the results section very briefly here. Note they don't use the, they don't use the numbers, but they, they explain what they found in the results. And then a little takeaway or discussion kind of information near the bottom, right? The part that'd be kind of from a discussion section. Now you'll also notice below it has uh, some keywords. So in APA style, you actually indent down here, and then in italics, you write the word keywords, and then after a colon, you put some keywords in normal font. This is just a few words related to the topic that'll make it easier to classify in databases and search systems and things like that. So here's another example of an abstract. The word abstract in bold up top, then notice no indenting in the paragraph itself, they bring up the topic first, so they're telling us what it's about, right? Uh, discussing uh, two differential theoretical accounts, so the motivated system two reasoning account. Then they briefly talk about the classical account. So they're saying here they investigated uh, media truth discernment or whatever to distinguish those two accounts. So it's like an introduction section right there, right? They gave just the, the basics of their introduction. Then they describe methodological stuff. So they talk about stuff that would come from a method section, like participants and what they did, like the procedure, the design kind of stuff. Then you can see this gets into the results. So they say things like, consistent with the classical account, we found that deliberation corrected intuitive mistakes. Participants believed false headlines, yada, yada, yada. Notice they don't include the statistical numbers here, but they do summarize the big takeaway from their results. And finally, they wrap it up with some context and what their data suggests for the bigger picture. So basically a little bit from their discussion section. It's all just like a big paper in miniature. And again, at the bottom, they do indent, they write the word keywords in italics, and then after a colon in normal font, they give some keywords. And you can actually see below that the next page on a brand new page, see the abstracts on its own page, and then on a brand new page, you get into the introduction section where they start the, the body, the kind of main body of the paper down there. So as you saw, the abstract is organized like a miniature paper. Usually that means a general sentence or two on your broad topic area or kind of introductory question about your topic and, and what more specifically you are studying about that topic or area. Give your specific hypothesis. Then briefly, how you are studying it. So this is your, your method section basically in one or two sentences. Then give something about your results. Again, just the most important and central stuff. So one or two sentences about what you found. No need for statistical numbers, but you might say whether it was significant or not. And then very briefly mention why it matters. Like why the expected results would be interesting or what it would mean for people in one to two sentences. So the space in this little section, it goes quick. You have to keep it brief and to the point. Only the most important stuff should be included in the abstract. It is a quick summary of your paper. At any rate, that covers the last significant bits of an APA style paper. So readers will usually start with the abstract up top and then dive into the main paper itself, which usually means an introduction, then a method, then the results, then the discussion section as we saw here. Finally, after all that stuff, there's always references for following up on all your citations plus any extra stuff like appendices or any tables and figures not yet embedded in the main body of the paper.